cord back. Okay. I think I can handle that. Yeah, this also, I mean, if you prefer a keyboard, you could do page up, page down. I'd rather just do that. Click the problem. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's a couple of minutes after 10, so we'll get started. And if anyone comes in late, they'll just miss the administrative announcements that I say every time I come here and do the bridge. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lawrence Brewer, Chief Records Officer. And I wanted to welcome everyone to the meeting, uh, actually the first bridge meeting of the Safe Track era. So <laughs> apologies to those of you on the phone who don't live in the DC area. But if you live in DC, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I feel your pain. Uh, I was talking to, to Lisa this morning, who was complaining about weights uh, on the orange line. So uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Safe Track are all the repairs that they're doing on Metro, which is probably going to go on for years. They say right now the schedule is, is like, what was it, like 18 months or so? Um, but we all know how that goes. So uh, I think it is more like an era than it is going to be 18 months. So uh, thanks for making the trip out. Appreciate you making the effort. Um, we have a good meeting this morning, uh, which started uh, with our networking session at 9 o'clock upstairs. So if you are here, thank you for coming. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to sit and talk with you over coffee and donuts about anything on your minds. Um, if you weren't able to make it and you're in the DC area, I encourage you before the next meeting, we have our networking sessions from 9 to 10 before every bridge meeting up in the presidential conference rooms. So please put that on your calendar. A um, few administrative announcements before we get started. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone that if you are in the room and you have a question or want to make a comment, we have microphones on the aisle. Um, I want to encourage you to wait um, to, to either go to the microphone or have a microphone passed to you so the people online can hear your question. And please be sure to, to say who you are and what agency you came from. Um, that also applies to folks on the webcast. Um, you will be able to type a question into the chat box, and we have Arthur over here monitoring the webcast. Please also indicate who you are and your agency so that we can read it off for the presenters um, if you have questions or comments. 
Uh, also, I would like to uh, let everyone know that as we always do in the afternoon, we have our meet and greet session with NARA staff. Today it is hosted by Appraisal Team One. Um, so if you are an agency that works with Appraisal Team One, I encourage you to attend. If not, you are also welcome to attend as well. Uh, we'll have our appraisal staff there and representatives from other NARA offices and the Federal Records Center program um, in attendance. And then finally, uh, last administrative announcement, if you uh, have a question or a comment or a suggestion about the bridge meetings, the networking session, or the meet and greets in general, um, I encourage you to send your emails to rm.communications at nara.gov, our general RM communications mailbox. Um, we would love to hear from you um, and any feedback that you have and way, ways that we can improve the meetings um, that we do on bridge days. So I have a, a couple of things that uh, before we get into the program uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention. We have uh, some, some good news, which I'll share first, and then a couple of RM communications that just recently came out that I wanted to just bring to your attention. First, the exciting news. Um, the first approvals for an agencies using the Capstone GRS were recently approved. So we're very pleased to announce that the National Archives and NSA were the first capstone of forms approved and posted on our website. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, these are the verification forms, the NA1005, that were submitted by these two agencies um, to request disposition authority for email managed under a capstone approach using GRS 6.1. So we are receiving a lot more. We, we have a growing list of NA1005s that we are working through. And I really wanted to encourage you uh, a couple of things. One, to, to keep track of, of what we are putting up on our website. We have an email management page where you can see how every agency in the government is proposing to, to provide disposition for their email. And we have a site which we call GitHub where we have the actual NA1005s posted which are searchable. So you can now go up to GitHub and you can find the NARA and the NSA approved forms and the other forms that will follow once they get approved. So the last thing I wanted to, to bring to your attention is that we are now almost six months from the December 31st deadline for email. And now's the time if you are planning on submitting an NA1005, um, I encourage you to, to get those submitted, um, do the work you need to do to complete the verification forms and get it to us so that we can make sure that we have them completed by the end of the calendar year so you have those approvals in place. The RM communications I wanted to bring to your attention, we had one posted on Friday and then we had another one posted yesterday. Uh, the first one um, has to do with our notice that we are canceling the expedited scheduling pilot. Um, as some of you may remember, in the March 2015 bridge, we did a session on the expedited pilot and what we were proposing to do as part of that pilot in terms of streamlining the processing of clearly temporary records. We have been working through the pilot and we have determined based on the data and discussions with our stakeholders that um, we did not feel that we were getting the sufficient return on investment for what we have put into place for going forward with expediting scheduling of temporary, clearly temporary records. Um, so we have canceled it and we decided we're gonna look at other ways that we might be able to expedite and improve scheduling. So we are uh, continuing to emphasize fast tracking certain schedules. And most importantly, we wanna be able to work with all of you in prioritizing schedules that, that you feel really need to be put up as a priority for, for scheduling. So we encourage those communications and that dialogue to make sure that we are doing what you need and what you need to get done first. The second communication um, had to do with um, our FAQ on changes to previously approved schedules. So um, a lot of you probably understand and are aware that that is a longer way of saying pen and inks to schedules, and we've traditionally called them pen and ink changes to schedules. And what they are is 
after the schedule's been approved, there are certain changes you can make to a schedule that don't require submitting a new schedule. So what we have uh, sent out in our notice yesterday is um, prior to FY2000, we will not be making pen and ink changes to schedules. The reason for this is the FY99 schedules and older um, have been accessioned into the National Archives, and we felt it's inappropriate to make changes to accessioned records. So going forward, if you have an FY2000 or later, then you're still okay, and, you need, and if you need to make a pen and ink change per that FAQ, that is, that is acceptable. If you have a schedule older than FY2000, then, um, then we need to submit a new schedule. And really what we are um, suggesting, and probably the better business reason for why we, sub why we sent the notice out yesterday, um, is that if you have a schedule that's 16 years old or older, it's probably not a bad idea to do a review and reschedule those records anyway. Um, so just to let you know, and just a reminder to review those communications, those are our two most recent um, communications um, out of the archives, and uh, I guarantee you there will be more coming very shortly. So um, I will now turn it over to the program. We have uh, three presentations scheduled for you today. Uh, first up, we have a presentation from the Office of Government Information Services within NARA, and we have our team sitting in front. It's going to give you an overview of what OGIS does. And then we have a presentation from the Federal Records Center program. We have Gordon Everett here, who's going to give you an update on upcoming 2017 items. And then we will wrap up the program with Lisa Harrell-Lampas, our Director of Policy and Outreach, who's going to do a detailed overview of our uh, recently issued uh, email management success criteria. So uh, we issued it a while ago, but, but because of the way the bridge meetings fall, we haven't really had a chance to do the detailed walkthrough of it. I know we have given you all an overview of what the email management success criteria is, but today we'll have a chance to really drill down into it and hopefully have some discussion and some comments um, and clarify anything that, that you have questions about. So with that, um, I will bring it up, up, I will turn it over to OGIS and advance the slide and turn the program over to them. Good morning. So I'm Kirsten Mitchell and I'm the compliance team lead at the Office of Government Information Services. I want to thank Lawrence for inviting us here today. Um, it's entirely appropriate that we're uh, presenting at a bridge meeting for two reasons. One is um, records management is the, a strong foundation for a good for Freedom of Information Act program. And the other is that um, OGIS sees itself as a bridge, a bridge between uh, FOIA requesters and federal agencies. So thanks for inviting us. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit about what we do. I'm going to talk mostly about our compliance program, but I'll give you a brief overview of our um, office in general. Um, so we're a, a small but mighty office. Um, there are um, 10 of us, although we are currently without a director. Um, we have a deputy director, Nikki Gramian, who's here. Please stand, Nikki. <laughs> and, um, as you can see, we have two teams, um, a mediation team and compliance team. We offer mediation services to FOIA requesters and federal agencies. We also have um, compliance. And Amy Bennett, please stand, Amy, is on our compliance team, which I lead. We also have an attorney advisor and a, an administrative officer. So um, our statutory role, Congress uh, amended FOIA in 2007 to create our office. Uh, and as I said, we review agency um, policies, procedures, and compliance. That's the, the compliance role. Um, here's the actual statutory language. In addition to mediation services, we also um, do the compliance, and we recommend policy changes to Congress and the President to improve 
the administration of FOIA. Um, so we've, this has been in the statute since 2007. We opened in 2009. And when our founding director walked into the office, there were requests for mediation waiting. Um, so there really wasn't a question as to what was going to be done first. It was mediation. Um, the compliance was a little slow to get started, um, but in 2015, uh, 2014, FY15, we really uh, got up and running, separated our mediation and compliance teams, uh, and, and got to work. So one of the things we do is uh, agency assessments, uh, and that's where we go into agencies and basically assess their compliance with the FOIA program. So I'm just going to walk you through the through what we do. Um, we have basically an internal review process. Then we have um, an external review process where we are visiting the agency, uh, and then we issue a final report. Um, we do initiation and planning. We meet with the agency, um, conduct a quick survey to get an idea of um, of how their FOIA activities are going. Uh, then we have, uh, we collect information. We collect lots of information. Uh, the agency FOIA regulations, data from the Department of Justice um, that they're required to uh, report to the Department of Justice on their FOIA uh, information. We looked at standard operating procedures, um, position descriptions, all sorts of things, uh, any management controls they have. And we spend about a week analyzing all that looking at the regulations, the agency FOIA website. We also look at litigation trends um, to see if there's any, any trends that we can spot. And then we do the external review, which is the on-site visit, um, interviews with the FOIA managers, um, a shadowing of a FOIA processor, and then case file review. And what that is is a, we draw a statistically significant sample size and review, um, pull those and review the FOIA case files. And that's something really, really unique. I mean, there's no one else in government or, or outside of government, obviously, who's doing that. Uh, then we come back and analyze all of this, write it. Um, then, of course, it goes through internal review in the office. Um, and then we do share a copy of it with um, the agency had and FOIA leaders before we make it public. Uh, and then we publish it and communicate it. Amy leads our Twitter presence, our blog presence, um, pushes that all out. Uh, and then 120 days after publication, we uh, follow up with the agency. So that's the summary of, of the program. So, and in, the, we, in these reports, we make recommendations, and I, I think the overarching thing that we've learned is there's no one-size-fits-all approach to administering FOIA. And I think that really speaks to the records. Um, every agency has different records. Um, they, it, it, it's all different. I mean, you cannot have a single FOIA program that's going to work at every, every different agency. Um, so, so far we've issued about 75 tailor-made recommendations uh, in six compliance reports, and they center on three things, um, management, technology, and communications. Whoa, cats. Um, why are cats up here? Well, um, any of you who've been in management know that uh, management is a bit like herding cats. So I pulled these from the... Uh, NARA catalog and bonus points to anyone who can identify these presidential felines. Uh, so when we look at management, we look at how does the FOIA program, given the resources it has, manage those resources to fulfill the statutory requirements of FOIA. Uh, some of our recommendations are super um, short-term, easily implemented type things, um, such as create standard operating procedures for processing FOIA requests and appeals. Uh, and you'll notice NARA is listed up there. Um, when we started this program, two of NARA's FOIA offices were kind enough to let us um, assess them, and so we assessed the Office of General Counsel and the uh, 
special access and FOIA program here at NARA. Uh, and we found they had um, great procedures for processing FOIA requests, but none of it was written down. Um, so we recommended that maybe it ought to be written down. Um, some of the management recommendations are much more ambitious and long-term. Um, Coast Guard has um, divisions all over the country, um, all these units, and nothing is really centralized. So we suggested a plan to centralize uh, that. I mean, we didn't suggest the plan, but we suggested that the Coast Guard create a plan. Um, and then improve records management practices. We suggested that to FEMA to help ensure an efficient FOIA process. So uh, technology is another big one, and these are uh, also from our catalog. Uh, we found that agencies are investing in technology to help the FOIA process, but they cannot or do not always take full advantage of it. Um, and again, these are recommendations. Some of them are pretty easy. Uh, fix broken links on web pages. Um, you know, overhaul web pages, review reference material for accuracy. We found a few um, links where uh, information wasn't entirely accurate. Um, create procedures for identifying records to post online. And then others are more ambitious and long-term. Um, here at NARA, we recommended considering convening a multi-disciplinary task force within the agency to address disparate technology. Um, and then uh, fully adopt tracking systems. As I said, many agencies do have technology, but they're not always fully using it. Um, and the next one is uh, communications. This is one where um, relatively low cost changes um, are equal particularly, or potentially big savings. We, as I mentioned, we look at FOIA litigation at the agencies that we assess. Uh, and one of the things, one of the trends we're spotting so far is that a lack of response or lack of communication with the requester is a factor in a majority of the FOIA um, lawsuits that we've looked at thus far. Um, and these are sorts of things that can eas easily be done, don't cost a whole lot of money. Things like providing requesters with estimated dates of completion. Um, that sounds like a wonderful communication tool, but it's also the law. Um, you know, just communicating regularly with FOIA requesters, explaining uh, the whole lingo of FOIA. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to uh, those of us who are in FOIA, but to the requester, not so much. So uh, agencies might be wondering, well, why would I want to subject myself to that? Um, but you know, this is a good way to, for agencies to ask themselves and, and get some answers as to how they're doing. Um, and one thing that we do is we evaluate the program in a holistic way, uh, and we're all, I, I mentioned Amy, Nikki, everyone in the office is a subject matter expert on FOIA. So that's something that we bring. Um, I mentioned the data reported annually to the Department of Justice. So agencies report this data to the Department of Justice, but we're really the only ones outside of a small number of NGOs that actually analyze the data and, and crunch the numbers and really take a hard look at it. Uh, and in addition to um, identifying areas of improve, for improvement and providing recommendations, we also identify FOIA best practices um, and promote those. Um, and a, a good example of that is the Transportation Security Administration. They created a form for the FOIA process that not only helped eliminate, um, you know, grammar errors, but also format errors and things that were kind of looking sloppy to, to the FOIA um, requester. So it can be as simple as that to things like at Customs and Border Protection. Um, they undertook a huge effort to um, improve their management practices, uh, both in the triage, um, increased staffing, and shifting resources um, to address problems. So as I mentioned, we started this FOIA agency assessment program in 
FY 2015, we started here at NARA, uh, and then we moved on to the Department of Homeland Security and did uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and Coast Guard, and we also launched um, Transportation Security Administration and Customs and Border Protection. So the current fiscal year, we've published uh, Transportation Security Administration Customs and Border Protection, and we ex the Secret Service report is currently with the agency, and we expect to publish that in the coming weeks. And then we're in, in the process of doing uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So for FY17, um, we're looking at doing um, headquarters of DHS, and then you can look for um, the following three um, agencies, when we release our FY17 calendar, you can expect to see Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and the U.S. Postal Service. Um, and we have other agencies who've come to us and said, hey, we might be interested, or hey, we might be interested for FY18. So it's never too early to, to let us know if you're interested. Um, so that's our agency assessment program. Uh, in addition to that, we also have some other oversight activities that we do. Um, we'll look at a single topic within FOIA. Uh, Amy just finished a pretty big project on still interested letters. Um, those are the letters that agencies send often after a long period of time has passed since the request was um, submitted that asks the requester, hey, are you still interested? We need to hear from you in 10 days or we're gonna close this request. Um, and so there was really not a whole lot out there. I mean, we heard a lot from some requesters that this was a problem, but there wasn't a lot out there about this subject. So Amy um, delved into it. She looked at 17 years worth of um, data from the Department of Justice on the subject. Um, talked to agencies um, and created this report, three reports actually, which are on our, our website, which is um, ogis.archives.gov. Uh, we'll also look at a particular part of a process, of the FOIA process, so if agencies don't want us to look at the whole process or they think, oh, you know, it's the triage process that we're having problems with, or it's the appeals process. We're happy just to look at that particular um, process. Um, agency FOIA regulations, and that, that's something we've been looking at since 2010. Um, we review agency FOIA regulations either through um, the public commenting process, the interagency process. We've also had agencies come to us before it even gets to that point and say, hey, we're thinking about redoing our FOIA regs. Um, can you help us out with this? And we'll work collaboratively with them. And finally, we do um, agency FOIA correspondence. Uh, agencies can submit their um, template letters and so forth to us, and we're happy to look at it um, for compliance with FOIA, but also just plain language. Um, so that is what we do. Uh, and the, here's our contact information for Nikki, Amy, and I. And I am very happy to take questions. Any questions? So you said you're on Twitter. That sounds like it would be fun to follow. Can you give us that Twitter handle? <laughs> Actually, you can give them the Twitter handle. Sure. It's at FOIA underscore ombuds. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> yeah, and also, please, fo please follow our blog. We have a great blog. Um, and you can get to all of this from our website, ogis at archives.gov. Questions, comments?
Thanks. I'm a fellow archives employee. Uh, when you do case file review, uh, in addition to things like timeliness and other things that I imagine you look at, do you look at uh, and try to figure out how responsive they really were in the record search, like how comprehensive the record search was? Um, we look at it to the extent that we look for things like search slips, um, and we've seen some good ones at some agencies where they have a, a good process for um, the person who's doing the search to fill out a slip and return it back. Um, <laughs> Some agencies, we don't see that, and we have recommended that they institute something of that sort. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, I will turn it back over to Gordon. Yes, thank you. Good morning. I have just uh, a couple of announcements, I should say three, uh, from the Federal Record Center program for uh, 2017. Obviously, uh, as we're uh, coming up on the end of our uh, uh, fiscal year, um, do we have somebody? Hey, Pam, can you close that door for us? Uh, oh, somebody's got it. As we come up on the end of the uh, fiscal year, we're starting the process of looking at the uh, 2017 uh, interagency agreement. So I wanted you to know that process has begun uh, in the Federal Record Center program and it starts with our uh, uh, financial person working with the uh, different center directors and forecasting uh, their workloads and, and things for 2017. Once he has that information, that information does come into him and goes to our uh, CFO uh, in NARA and, and then over to the Archivist of the United States to uh, approve uh, the rates for the fiscal year. Uh, w our target uh, for this year is to have our agreements to you guys, for the account managers to have the agreements for you guys, uh, is September the 1st. That's probably earlier than you've had it in the last few years, but that is the target that we're working on. And um, to date, we're still on, on, uh, on our uh, target. We're still on goal to hit that target date. So. Uh, look for that. Now, if you want to get your agreement started, uh, prior to that, that's not a problem. We do have some customers who are working on agreements now for 2017. We can always do that. Uh, it's just that we won't have the official rates until they're approved by the Archivist of the United States, but we can certainly uh, start the agreement process at this point. The second thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about is you will receive a, uh, from your account managers a uh, narrow communication uh, in the next few days uh, about a couple of different um, things that are going to happen in 2017. We've had some requests over the last couple of years uh, that customers who want it for strategic reasons to reserve uh, storage space. And uh, with the amount of capacity that we have, we had some problems, or not problems, we were unable to offer reserve space to customers with that. But uh, beginning uh, in 2017, we will be able to offer customers uh, reserve space who needs it uh, or who have a need, strategic need for it. Uh, it will be just as uh, uh, your, you can reserve that space just as you have boxes on those shelves and there's uh, a normal rate uh, to do that. But everybody doesn't need that, but strategically customers from time to time may need to reserve some space, may need some contiguous space to reserve at some point, and we will offer that service uh, to our customers. So you'll see communication coming out on that. Uh, at least by the end of this week, you should have it from your account manager. The last thing I wanted to uh, bring up and mention, we've talked uh, a little, well, not a little, we've talked a lot over the last year about Arcus and, and now Arcus. Uh, surcharge that kicks in in 2017. Uh, and so with the new fiscal year, uh, there will be a, 
uh, a small surcharge for um, transfers and references, reference that are handled, that are paper born. So if you're in ARCUS 2.0 and you can do that work through ARCUS 2.0, there is no fee to do that. But uh, when you have to do that uh, via paper, there'll be a slight surcharge to handle those uh, fees. So we, try, we want to encourage <coughs> all of our customers uh, as best as possible to, to, to make sure you're working in Arcus, you're set up on Arcus. If not, let's get to your uh, account manager and uh, we can get you guys set up on Arcus fairly quickly. Um, there are some things that we'll need to do to do that, but through Arcus, you can do your reference requests. You can do submit records transfers. There is increased levels of security that you can apply uh, to your record. So we just want to make customers aware of it. It is coming out in our announcement, there is, so there will be that small surcharge. And this is all really a part of, you know, having to initiate online requests and transfers. That's a part of the management government directive uh, that was issued in 2012. And, you know, this requires to the fullest extent possible that agencies eliminate paper and electronic record keeping, and we're trying to help our agencies do that. So. Uh, we're going to encourage you to, if you're not there, uh, and if you can, let's work through Arcus, and you'll find it to be a very efficient tool uh, in handling your records. Any questions on any of those items? Or any other items for the Federal Record Center program? Sure. Um, I'm Stephanie Washington from Small Business Administration, mm -hmm. and I have a question regarding the Arcus system. Okay. For the records transfer, when we start to do it online, put the request in online, I know for the paper version, usually the approval takes between, I think, five to ten days to get approved. Will that time frame still be the same even though we're doing it online? Yeah, that time frame will remain the same. You may get a quicker response, but we're going to still maintain our, you know, that uh, I think it's ten days we have to respond. Most of them are a lot shorter than that. But uh, I'm sure online it, it should come a little bit faster, but we want to keep the same time frame. Okay. All right, anything online? Any questions? <coughs> okay. Any other questions or anything on the Federal Records Center program? If not, thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Harrell-Lampas. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome everyone. I am here today, um, Lisa Harrell-Lampas, the Director of Policy and Outreach from our Office of the Chief Records Officer for the U.S. Government Staff. That was my title, which is uh, a lot easier just to say, Lisa Harrell-Lampas. And I've actually got two topics to talk to you today about. The first is presidential, or I should say the administration transition, and the second is our email management success criteria. So the first topic is the presidential change of administration. And why are we talking about that now? Well, it's that time again. It's every four years, records management becomes very eventful in the federal government. There are many record schedules and disposition instructions that say when administration changes, that's the time that records become inactive, that's the time for cutoff, and that's the time that we're all working very hard in records management to make sure that we've properly captured, documented, um, indexed, stored, and preserved the records of seniors officials as they're leaving. It's also a time of awareness in records management because we do tend to have at very high levels a lot of senior agency official turnover. People who are leaving who sometimes say, oh yes, that's right, I remember this records management. And people who come into federal service who have never heard the definition of a federal record, who do not know there's such a thing as a federal records officer in their agency to help them manage their records, and have certainly never heard of the Federal Records Act. So it's an awareness and an opportunity to bring education to folks who really need it so they can start the ground, uh, start their new positions, hitting the ground running, and not have to worry about records management because it's going to be taken care of for them. 
So NARA, to help in an awareness effort, we have produced and are producing several products. And I wanted to highlight for you today some of the work we've done as a resource for you in the federal records community so that you can take these products, use them, adapt them any which way you want or do any briefing products or any use them in any briefings that you wish. So the first product I wanted you to be aware that has been updated is documenting your public service. This title is hopefully something you have uh, remember and have seen. We have used this title for this, record, uh, this publication for over 20 years. The you in that, the your in that, such, in that title refers to federal employees. So this is written for any federal employee when they come in. What do you need to know? Welcome to federal service. How do you document your public service? Um, we hadn't updated it for about eight years. Again, it's that time in records management when we look at our products and make sure we've got information up to date. And there was a lot to add, and there was a lot to discuss. So we've put in references to the Federal Records Act and the great, if you're getting information on a personal account, you have 20 days to forward it. That's probably something most federal employees should be aware of, um, something that's in a lot of records training, so we've added that. It just generally provides information on record keeping. It's on our website, so it's easy to find, easy to cut and paste. And it's a pretty long publication. It goes actually about five or six pages. So it was meant to be more of an in-depth welcome to uh, records management, everything a federal employee <laughs> needs to know. We also created a one-page handout recently. And it is records management guidance for political employees. This document, I'm sorry to say, is not on our website this morning, but hopefully by this afternoon will be. It is going to live on the same page as the documenting your public service uh, information. So if you go to that link, you will see this little one-page handout as well. Again, the uh, documenting your public service is a longer in-depth thing, but if you just want to tell somebody, when you come in, you need to make sure you've started to set up your records properly, you need to know what a record is. While you're working, you need to be aware of filing and documentation. And when you leave, you need to be aware you can't take records with you. So it's just a nice uh, sort of one-page handout that we've used. Um, it's more designed uh, for it's the audience. It's intended to be uh, political appointees. And we have two other products that we're working on that we hope will help raise awareness and help improve, uh, make records management um, smoother during the transition. <laughs> The first one, I mentioned the second um, one, is a video briefing. So you've got your, your records management publication for people who can really stand and hand, you know, want to know information. A one-pager for political employees is just a handout to start, just to start with overness, overview and awareness. And for people who don't want to read but want to listen, we're creating a video briefing. And again, it's going to be targeted to political appointees. And the reason you're seeing the face of the archivist of the United States here is he's actually been very active in this area for us this year, and he has um, volunteered to do the introduction for our narration of this video. So first you get to hear the archivist speaking, and his message is, as a political appointee myself, I'm very well aware of you know, your role, think the pressures you face, and the importance of records. And as the political appointee running the National Archives, I very much look forward to someday having your records in our collections where I will be able to maintain them. So hopefully that will be. Um, five minutes or so, so just a nice quick briefing depending on if you have an awareness opportunity, if you just want to shoot out links and information, we'll have a variety of resources that you can use, again, or tailor. The other problem, um, and the, the documenting your public service is available now. The one pager should be available this week, and this video briefing will be up um, in the next few weeks. So putting the final touches on it and making sure that it runs smoothly and will be um, posted to our, our YouTube channel. So you should be hopefully able to access it online. The last set of products that we at NARA are working on to help with records management awareness during this time of transition is a series of model checklists. So many, many agencies have entrance uh, checklists and exit checklists. When you come on board and when you leave, you have to go through a variety of checklists, things that say, have you, um, you know, turned in, uh, or rather, when you come on board, you know, have you seen HR, have you, who, who have you talked to, what have you had to do to onboard and, and, and leave? And some model checklists have a few records questions on them. 
So we actually did an exercise with our colleagues in the Federal Records Officer Network. We got some information from them and from a few other agencies. And we sort of looked at entrance checklists and exit checklists that were used for records management and are creating some models. Like this has pulled all the best questions we ever saw and put them together. And that resource we thought might be very helpful as this might be a time of transition, again, a time to sort of look at your own practices and processes and update if possible. These are the questions that we'd want to double check. Welcome to Federal Records, your onboarding. Are you aware that you have record schedules? Do you know where to go for information? Just some sort of general questions. And again, the exit questions as well. So that will be available in July. So those are our products that we're creating for you to use. We are also doing some work that I thought you might be interested to, to learn about with the Partnership for Public Service. That is the uh, non-governmental office that is helping to coordinate transition from a very practical logistical perspective. So they work with all agencies that provide services during the transition. So they work with GSA, they work with OPM, they work um, with the National Archives, with the Office of Ethics. So if you're going to be coming as a uh, political appointee or as the head of a new agency, you have to know, are you eligible for a clearance? Have you gone through the ethics screening? Where are you going to sit? Like, how, does, how are we actually supporting transition? And we're starting to do that work um, now we actually started uh, last year in April, just to try to make this, as we always do, every year is going, every transition, this is going to be even better than the last time. We're gonna minim try to minimize the amount of time it takes to get the federal government up and running. So NARA is a transition service provider, but not the way you might think. Um, ordinarily, we're at the table because we provide services to the White House. So as you know, all of Obama's records are coming in, and we, try to, we have a very, very close relationship under the Presidential Records Act. But since we're in there for the presidential records, we're also promoting as best we can federal records management. So GSA puts together a presidential transition handbook, literally a handbook they will hand to people when they come in, welcome to the federal government, you know, your campaign has won the election, you have from November to January to get ready, here are things you need to be knowing about as you start to figure out you know, coming to new agencies. Well, we're getting records management in that handbook. We've sort of put in there, these are the requirements, things you've seen in all these other products we keep putting in there. So hopefully if you as the records management community are reaching out to the incoming and outgoing employees, they'll be ready to shake your hand because they will have heard as well. We've done some briefings through the Partnership for Public Service for assistant secretaries for assistant secretaries for administration and management so that they're aware of what their outgoing briefing responsibilities and what the incoming are. So that was sort of just an awareness. I'm sure that this is it's not new. It's that time again. I'm sure many agencies are preparing for a transition. And so we wanted to let you know what products we've done for awareness and just give you some information about some of the work we've been doing. And if you have any questions on transition, I'll stop now and take those. Or if you just had some practical logistics you wanted to send to me later, um, you can send it to our my office and our email, which is PRMD, the Presidential Records Management Directive, or you can just send it to me at lisa.haralampus at nara.gov. Yeah. Just keep talking, Patty's going to pick okay. you. Patty Stockman, NASA. So I had uh, several questions. Um, I'd actually emailed you in advance, but I know you've been covered over. Having to do with um, transition teams, I understand that we have, I've never been real plugged in with our transition at NASA, but this year I am. And I understand we'll have non-civil servants, non-feds, individuals who come in on transition teams. So my questions are, should we brief them about records management responsibilities? One, um, should we plan to retain copies of any kinds of materials they produce as records? And, um, and what was the other one? And the third that's, question that's was, much. are the records they create federal records? Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. So should we plan to capture them? Right. I know, so thank you. Patty always asks us really great questions, and I'm so glad you asked me ahead of time because I wanted to make sure I had the right answers. So I've confirmed two of the three. The first answer is yes. The transition teams that are coming in are exactly the people you want to brief because they're the ones who are likely to end up being the Schedule C and political appointees who help support. So they kind of send in teams ahead of time. They may not have the actual political appointees, but these transition teams are coming in. You know, what do we need to know? 
They tend to ask for information per the handbook. You know, they want to know about budgets, organizations, or trying to understand the agency. They also like to hear sort of like, well, coming in, what's the first 30 days? What is, what is the new person going to need to do in 30 days? What are they going to need to do in 60 days? So they're kind of looking, you know, because they don't want to miss a major decision point because they're not prepared. <coughs> but then again, they also have to figure out how, how, does, how do we function, you know, where is, what's the budget, what's the organization, what are they looking like? So some of the information that the government gives to transition teams is um, copies of information. So you could say, yeah, this is purely copies. I am just providing you, you know, briefing books full of copies. But we do need to maintain, so that was the second answer, like from the government perspective, what did you tell the incoming transition? And there are some record schedules that cover that in agencies. I sort of said like for a transition, like these are the, this is the retention period for that. And other agencies, it's not as clear. So you have to sort of go through and figure out, well, how long do we need to maintain into the government control what we shared with the transition team? So you definitely need to brief them. We definitely keep the government copy. And I was actually trying to get in contact to confirm, because I don't believe the transition employees are considered to be federal employees yet, the copies they make, I'm not sure if they qualified as federal records, whether they would be applicable to the FOIA Act. So that's the kind of the question. I'm like, whether they're a record is one question, what the other threshold was another. And that's actually one of the questions we've been asked by the partnership, too. They're like, people sometimes say, well, I'll, I'll read this briefing book, but I'm not, I don't want to take it into the office because that'll make it a federal record. So that's the kind of thing we can help explain training-wise. That's not what the threshold of a federal record is, you know, whether it's in the building or not in the building. <laughs> the threshold of what's a federal record is, uh, is it being made or created, you know, in conduct of business. But I do feel there's a nuance there because they're not technically in the federal. But then they tend to work in the transition teams. They tend to be in the uh, agency space. And we would recommend getting them agency email accounts as soon as possible. So again, they're doing their work on official accounts, you know. Because it just takes time for, as we all know, we've all been onboarded in the federal government. It never just happens overnight. There's this, this little bit of a delay process. So those are sort of the things that we're, we're looking at. So I don't quite have the final answer to your question, but I'll find some more information and I can share that on our, we could do a blog post on our Records Express blog, it's sort of the questions that we're getting and, and try to share information that way. So great questions. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time. It always, we, are hoped, we always hope to do slightly better every year. Like we can, every transition, we can make records better every time. Does anybody else have a discussion point or a comment that might help if there's something uh, similar in their agency of dealing with transition? Or any other questions? And I know we have a 40 second delay for folks who are watching this on YouTube. So I'm, that's why we always, that's why we always pause for so long. I'm like just waiting. Yeah, that's right. So I have the, the 40 second tap dance. Is there any questions? Okay. All right. Well, with that, that is just sort of the highlights, one of our um, activities we were doing. We want, definitely wanted to talk to you at our bridge meeting. And now I'm going to do a, the, the promised deep dive into success criteria for managing email. So I'm starting my presentation with this lovely slide that hopefully you've seen many times before. We started putting this slide together in our presentations because we realized we've talked about email so long. Sometimes people, um, the nice part about this slide deck when you find online is all of these are hyperlinked. They take you straight to the story of the policies, the guidance, what we've been saying about email since 2011. We've actually said more. We, certainly email's not new. But just I like to put this story, sort of 2011, what the framework is. We've talked about email quite a bit. We've done the directive, the, our capstone bulletin. The transfer guidance is up there because that's where we actually talked about formats for um, a variety of records, including email. We talked about OMB putting out a second um, memo in 2016 that said, you know, or 2014 that <coughs> said it was very important to train email. We had a new law. We've continued to do metadata, uh, capstone GRS. And through all of that, we started hearing, because we were very clear with our, um, the goal, which is manage email, and temper, uh, manage email in both temporary and permanent email in accessible format. And we asked questions in the RMSA. We asked questions in our senior agency official report. Are you going to manage email? And what the piece that we realized we were missing was we were all talking about managing email. And we all meant it slightly differently. 
So yes, we are going to manage email. And in my agency, that meant you know, it's doing better disposition. In my agency, that means we're no longer printing and filing. But we didn't have a common understanding of what did it mean to successfully manage email. So the questions we were asking, are you going to meet the deadline? Are you going to be able to manage email? Everybody's like, of course. And they're like, really, very few agencies said, well, we're not quite sure. And those were probably the agencies that were thinking of email management in a very fulsome way versus saying, well, I'm going to stop printing and filing. That doesn't necessarily say that I'm going to start managing my email. So we created, that was the reason behind it, a um, criteria for managing email. We tried to have, make sure NARA's starting point was on the same page. Well, what did we mean when we said successful email management? So we have issued this guidance. It is um, little g guidance. In other words, it's not something that we're putting forward as a bulletin or you, know, you must do this, because it's really an explanation document. What we did was we worked with several um, agencies, actually, for start. We had several focus groups. And we did a review of all of the guidance and the policies and things we put together. And we sort of repackaged, what does it mean to manage your email? When we created this report, uh, you'll find it available on our email management page. And the report, um, and we realized we were having this conversation. We had three different audiences we were trying to talk to. Because when you ask, what does it mean to e manage email, it depends what audience you're talking to. So the document itself addresses those three different audiences. First, there's a forward from the archivist, which is, again, he's very passionate in making sure we get uh, email management right, that we're handling the transition well. So he sort of is talking to those senior agency officials saying, this is important. You need to address this. And we actually have a few pages, which is, what is email management? And NARA is defining successful email management as having the policies and systems in place to access records over time and implement their disposition. And that is the one sentence phrase you can take around and say from this presentation, yes, I know what successful email management means. It means having the policies and systems in place to access records over time and execute their disposition. It doesn't quite flow off the tongue, but I've been practicing that now for six months, so I can say it with uh, authority. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, you will as well. So we sort of have this high level, what does that mean? It's a couple of pages that's written to, for, um, for senior agency officials or for people who are trying to understand what does NARA achieve. And then we have two appendixes. One are questions for discussion. And that was actually aimed at you as the audience of like a federal records audience. What questions would you be asking as records officers? Am I managing email well? And then last but not least, we have the audience that would be more of a, a technical implementation audience. We based a series, we call this Appendix B. It kind of looks like this. And we said, here's the requirements, here's the category. Is it policies? Um, is it sort of policies related to appraisal and scheduling, to maintenance and use, to disposition? And then we listed the requirement and where it came from. So again, this document to determine what is email management was based on a synthesis, an analysis of all of the requirements we'd had in that first um, bulletin. Everything we've said in laws, regulations, and guidance sort of pulled it together and said, this is what those requirements are. And we hope that by displaying information in these three different ways, we're really having a very thoughtful conversations to make sure we're managing email effectively. Oh, sorry, I already covered why we needed them. Um, again, to make sure we had a res to use that for them to be a resource for you to provide this common understanding. And it's our goal to be able to incorporate these questions and these requirements into future oversight and evaluation. So you could expect to see some of these types of questions appearing in the RMSA in the future or maybe in an SAO report where we say, you know, you're responsible for the strategy for managing email. Do you have policies in place? What systems are you using? Have you, are you able to effectively access that information over time? And I guess when the most, um, for NARA, from our perspective as the National Archives, when we actually start receiving transfers of permanently valuable email under the approach, we will know that we've been successful in email management. So again, what are those four criteria? NARA describe we call these categories. So the way we kind of described it was in one sentence. You know, we think successful management is having policies and systems in place to be able to access information over time and execute disposition. See, we're going to say this over and over, and then we're going to walk away saying, I know what it is. So we're going to look into those four categories, because that's how we sort of broke it out. There's four places that we need to concentrate, or four criterion. 
So policies is the start because you can't sort of say I'm successfully managing email until you know what your strategy is for email management. <laughs> for example, are you a capstone agency or do you have a different process in place? What policies do you have? Some agencies have policies in place that say flat out, we do not allow any, we do not allow, we do not permit agencies to use personal email to do federal business. So it doesn't have to be groundbreaking, but it's sort of like saying, I've got a place where I've laid out, these are the policies that relate to email management. I know um, for our colleagues in OGIS and for folks who are doing FOIA, if you don't have a clearly defined explanation of how long you retain email, that it's very hard to be able to say I've adequately done a FOIA search because I don't know where my email was in the beginning. So again, records management being the backbone, we start with the backbone, what are the policies? And again, our document here say you tell them what their policies are, you develop, uh, develop them with relevant stakeholders. That's classic. And then in our document, we tried to sort of say you got to have some policies and this is what success looks like. So you would say, I've got a policy, and I was able to actually train to that policy. It was understandable. And people now know what my responsibilities are for managing records. <laughs> An example under capstone, as you could say, wonderful. I'm taking a capstone approach, and we are just saving all email for seven years. Well, what is an employee's responsibility in that case? Well, the answer would be nothing, right? I no longer have to click and file. But they still should probably be aware that all of their email is going to be kept for a certain time frame and therefore would be available to them to research, to back, to use. Or, again, the, if you get email in a personal account, you need to forward it to your email account and why that's important. Um, we talk about, you see in this guidance, it's one of the first places we've started bringing in um, marking requirements and handling requirements for classified email. Because when we looked at all of our requirements that were out for email, we kind of looked at what is the National Archives done, what are the policies that are out there, and we tried to make this a place that we put it all together. So you'll see there are requirements for handling email, and we'd like to make sure that people are aware of those as well. So again, we would start with this is what the policies are. We would go into what does success look like, and these are some of the samples of the questions you see in Appendix A. So has your agency got a policy? Has it actually developed it, disseminated and implemented it? Because um, a policy that, because a lot of times people will say, yes, I'm going to meet the goal. I've already developed a working group. We are thinking about policies. So we would say, well, successful email management would be having the policy and actually implementing and disseminating it. And that's part of what we realize is going to be happening with 2016. We suspect that there would be a lot of people who are working on parts of this criteria who will say, yes, I've developed it, or I've developed it to cover, I've issued something on the, um, the requirement to do 20 days. We took care of that last year. We implemented it. But I'm actually doing a wholesale review of all of my email policies to make sure they're up to date. So there will be different pieces um, that people will be working on. Did your agency have policies and procedures in place that explain how you would access email? Again, it's one of those tough questions which a person leaves. This is, again, the transition is important uh, for email management. When people leave and their emails become inactive, what policies do you have in place to say, well, I will have stored the email of the senior officials who've left. I will be able to access them. And here's what it takes to access that information. Not just anybody can have access to it. Here's our policies that govern. The next item is systems themselves. I know systems is probably unusual. Maybe if you are in a smaller organization, you'd say, we only have one email system. This is not a hard, a hard one to know. But in larger organizations and in many organizations, it's not a one and done. There's usually more than one email system that had been used or has been used over time. Sometimes um, public affairs offices may have a separate email system because the nature of their business they're just more susceptible to having uh, virus and spam. and So they'll just segregate them off and say, this is an email system for one. Or you'll have um, classified email systems, unclassified email systems. Again, the, um, legacy email systems. We're always migrating. We're always trying to improve. So first, there's the idea that you as an agency, as a records officer, I know where my email are. I know what systems are. And that's just the systems to send and receive the email. Those are not necessarily the systems that are used to store and preserve email. So it's, again, trying to figure out what systems do we have in place that manage? Because you may have to go back 10 years, 
going back 10 years to find email, that's probably not in the native system. What does it look like if you have success? Well, you've, again, they're able to do, execute the policies. I've got systems in place. They're not being um, built, they're not being considered, they're not in acquisitions, they're actually in place, and they can execute those policies. Some of the questions, again, you can see it's a little bit of a repeat here, but that would just sort of be the basic. Is it, do you have a handle? Do you, are you aware of all of the systems that are used to store and manage email messages? And who has the responsibility for those systems? Should be probably in the CIO office, but again, who in the CIO office would you say is the authority that knows I'm managing the requirements, I've got the implementation strategies, the migration strategies, and I'm making sure that I can manage those emails? How is disposition being carried out is one of the questions in the system. In other words, is your email system itself able to delete, or do you have to have other systems in place to make sure the deletion is happening? Access. So the first two are actually, I think, a little um, straightforward, and hopefully people are like, yeah, policies and systems, that would be the start to having successful email management. And I think that when a lot of agencies said, of course, we're going to be able to manage our email by 2016, they were thinking, I'm going to stop printing and filing, and I'm going to manage in the systems that I currently have. But we wanted to make it clear there's a part to records management called access. That email must be, and we've defined access as you can find the information, retrieve the information, and use or reuse the information. So ex for example, find, retrieve, and use. If you've got an email store but you have no way to access it, and <coughs> when you do access it, you've got um, images, not email that can be sent or received, have you really been able to access it? If your email is encrypted, so I can find the email, but I can't actually unlock it and read it. Certainly won't help NARA when it comes time to um, preserve those records for the historical, uh, historical record, but it won't help you either. So there's some real questions you have to ask about, can I access, find, use, and reuse my email throughout its life cycle? And if it's seven years, hopefully that's one period. If it's 15 years, that's another period. And when it gets to 20 to 30 years, it's a really difficult question of knowing, can you access email over time? So access over time. Again, what does success look like when you're doing good access? You've got email content, context, and structure. So those classic records management principles haven't disappeared. This is where you see them um, from successful email management. They're protected against unauthorized loss, unauthorized access, and they are reusable over the entire, again, the entire record schedule. You'll see there's a lot of repetition here because things don't fall neatly into four categories. You have policies for disposition, policies for access, policies for system. The systems have to support all things, but it's just four buckets to think about successful email management. On the questions we asked, you can see it kind of makes sense here. These are the questions you'll see in Appendix A related to email management. Can you perform a search under all, for, all, for multiple email accounts in multiple systems to find what you're looking for. And as we know, people have more than one account, and they have more than one system. How are they being found? And then last but not least, it wouldn't be good records management if we didn't talk about deletion and transfer. So we put a whole bucket in place to say that is NARA's goal with electronic records management. When we set up the directive, we said we wanted email to be managed electronically. We wanted to come up with new approaches to get individuals out of it, so we'll have collections of email we can store and maintain over time. Collections of email we think will be historically valuable. So to get to disposition, what is your approval? What's the schedule? What's the authority to delete email? Is it going to be agency specific? Is it going to use capstone? Are you using another approach? I would be remiss if I didn't say capstone is an approach, but it may not be the only approach. And we're certainly open to hearing how agencies probably have a variety of approaches they use to manage email. What does success look like? You do indeed have identified retention periods, and you have those systems and policies in place to actually do it. We should talk, and again, these are some of the questions that were on Appendix um, A, but I'll also point out Appendix A talks here about litigation holds. So do you have the policies in place that allow you to say, nope, I'm going to stop doing deletion if there's a, um, a litigation? Do you have other questions on disposition would be, 
Um, what formats are you maintaining? And you'll see that in system and formats as well. It goes back to that format guidance. There's certain formats that we think will be able to sustain longer term, other ones we don't think will be um, as useful. And I am talking about <coughs> Lotus Notes in that situation. So those are the questions that you'll find. And that was, believe it or not, the deep, uh, the deep dive. So the document, you kind of, what I'm hoping I've given you here is that NARA believes successful email management is having the policies and systems in place to do access over time and execute disposition. You can all uh, recite that now, correct? And when you look at that document, you'll see the types of questions and the specific requirements that get in there. And we would encourage you, um, if you have any questions, to contact us. You can contact us in a variety of ways. You can contact me directly. You can contact my team, that, that is our team email. And you can contact us on our Records Express blog. We do have the blog that's up there. I know that if you have questions that you put there, we would be able to have a dialogue in that uh, public space as well. So I'm sure with that successful criteria for email management, some people may have some comments or some thoughts about what they, ex what they wanted to see, what they have seen. Um, if they're maybe surprised about what the success criteria was. I know sometimes when we told people we were issuing success criteria, there were some different viewpoints of what it could be. I um, sort of pause and ask if there's any comments or questions or. And I will ask again and keep waiting in case somebody on the computer or is one of our YouTube uh, watchers has any, has, but is actually reading the criteria while we speak and can ask me good questions. So again, I will leave it. That's what the criteria's purpose is. It's to get us on the same page. Uh, we will be looking over the next year and two years at how we can use the criteria as part of our oversight and evaluation program. We know we're going to be asked very soon in 2017 and would be expected to be able to answer our agencies managing their email. And this is the kind of the example of where we'll be able to say, well, these are the types of questions we want to ask. We will not probably see that as a yes and no black and white question because it's too big of, a, it's too big of a, an issue. What they really want to know is are agencies moving towards electronic management? Are they able to find their information? Are they able to retrieve it? So we'll sort of be able to say, well, there are many agencies have good policies in place. They're getting the systems in place to manage it now. We expect that there will be effective um, access retrieval. And Lisa, I have a question. <laughs> Yay. Tom Covell writes, is NARA aware of any agency using journaling as a part of a plan to successfully manage emails, especially with regards to capstone officials? If so, how is that agency calling non-record material? Thank you for asking that question because I happen to know of one agency that's doing that, and that agency is the National Archives and Records Administration. So our own office, our corporate records office, are in a very difficult place because they have to make sure they are implementing the guidance that NARA, the chief records officer, can do. So it's always a fun job to be the records officer for the National Archives. They are our test bin, and we ask them to try to implement first what we've done. So NARA's records management policy, we do have one system that is used for archiving, but we have also, so it's in addition, it's not, journaling isn't the sole electronic, um, isn't the sole email strategy, but it's part of our email management strategy. And um, we save that for one year. And if Tom would like to uh, reach out to us, I could provide him some more information and specifics on how we do that. I know other agencies are doing it, but I don't have the, um, the specifics in my head. I would have to go back and it's part of our email management strategy. Like I'm looking at. Uh, You're looking okay. at me, that's all right. Yeah. Okay. So that's the answer, so he's that nodding. That is the answer, sure. yeah. And, and I have yeah. one more from Tom. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, is NARA aware of other technology solutions to minimize, eliminate, or eliminate the need for the user to go through each email and identify whether it is a record or a non-record? Well, for each user to go through, there are um, agencies, just Department of Interior and others, that are looking for auto-categorization. So instead of having the users go through, they're trying to teach the machines how to go through and do and identify that information. Um, that is the one, that's the one entity that I, could, I can think of off the top of my head. 
With Capstone, we're trying to get users away from having to make that decision, but there still is an entire process, a thought process of records officers, the appraisal team, um, the agency stakeholders trying to say, these are the accounts that we think would likely be um, making permanent records. So from my perspective, there still is a community making a decision on where that information might reside versus making the individual make the decision. I should say the other question that was asked that I did not answer, Tom, you asked about culling, and I appreciate that. You asked a question about if you're doing journaling or you're doing an email management approach, um, as we've said, NARA didn't say you had to save everything. If you read our capstone approach, we certainly said agencies are, has, should consider what I don't want to save, what you want to cull. We left that open-ended. At the National Archives, we have some automated rules for culling. So when we went to implement, we said, yeah, we're not saving um, email blasts. We're not saving spam. We're not saving, as I like to say it, the Federal Computer Week advertisements that go through. But we did those um, culling rules as automated rules, so they're not individuals having to make the, some of those decisions. We also, at the National Archives, are allowing individuals to, instead of click and file, which would be opting into the record system, we are allowing individuals to opt out so they can click and unfile. And that was so that they had identified personal records. We could say, yes, you can take your personal materials out of, out of the, um, the system. That is a choice that NARA made when it decided how it was going to implement its, um, the guidance that NARA made. So again, two offices in our office, we put that guidance out. That's how the National Archives at that time made the decisions on how they were going to implement email management. And I think other agencies are doing things similar, and some agencies have said there's no opt-out from their perspective, from a risk perspective. It's just easier to maintain every, um, all email that's captured with only automated um, deletion, all automated culling rules, as it's easier to defend this was the system versus this is an individual making a decision. And it's defend is probably the correct word to use there. So Tom, I hope that helps. And if you'd like to have further conversation about it, please let us know. We'd be happy to talk offline. Tom says, thank you, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. So Lisa, I have follow-up uh, oh, to talk you. to your answer to Tom. So the, the opting out capability, Yes. Is that a le are you saying you've implemented that with your senior officials, your Correct. capstone officials? And so that's an opting out feature for specific emails, is that? Correct. I'm so sure. we have at the National Archives, as I think the I believe the philosophy was when we implemented our email system and went with capstone in 2013, if we at the National Archives can't identify a non-record, nobody should, right, like this is this would be a problem. So given who we are and given what our risks are for our records collections. We're not a high litigation risk agency. So I will say that that's part of our cal that was part of the calculus. We decided that for all email will be captured, but if anyone in the National Archives, including capstone officials, want to label their email as non-record or as personal, they can set up, because we use Gmail, a label, and then they can apply that label to the records. And those records will not be captured by our archiving tool. So our archiving tool sort of crawls, goes through the email, and picks up all email unless it's been flagged. The journaling tool picks up everything. So we have a one-year backup of every, a one-year collection of every email ever sent. But for, for, for your senior officials. For, for everybody at the entire, in the National Archives. And then for our capstone implementation, the archive is only picking up emails which have, um, picking up all emails unless it's been flagged as non-record. Using journaling or no? I Free think it uses a different calling technique. The journal, I mean, the same technique, one used for journaling and one used for um, archive. And you, in the journaling um, feature that you're doing, is that where you call out the email blasts? No, I think the journaling feature captures everything. It's literally all email sent and, kept and sent back and forth, for everything kept for one year. I think they use the journaling feature, for example, if we were to have um, security investigation, and they want to know, you know what was sent or not sent, you could say that was the entire uh, set of emails. If we got a FOIA request, we have to ask people, well, what is it you want us to search? Do you want us to search our archive, where which we've kept records, which is where we expect to maintain over time? But if necessary, we can also search our journaling file for one year. Thanks. But again, it's a retention policy. 
So now we can say our archive for seven years were capturing everything that was identified as a record with the exception that yes, people could have deleted, we will be able to explain. We had this policy in place that allowed users to opt out. So I'm a capstone official and I see an email coming through that is related to a personal event and I, you know, blueberry picking, um, can just say, I'm, nope, <laughs> delete it. If the official does nothing, then the blueberry picking is part of the record. I'd like to try to always find examples because people ask, like, you know, it's like soccer schedules, doctor's appointments, um, things totally personal that we would ordinarily not keep. But since we strongly encouraged capstone officials to use official accounts, I could see where people would say, yeah, I, wasn't, I didn't get out my personal device. I just sent that email. Now it's part of the historical record. Now it's going to come to the National Archives. Um, and that's part of the, um, the I'd say that, and that's part of the deal. That's part of the capstone deal. We'd rather take pers a few personal emails and make sure we're getting record emails than, um, than the other way around. And let me just ask a clarifying question of something you had said about the capstone approach that NARA hoped that that would help, if I understand correctly, help alleviate agency, the burden on agencies to have employees proclaim record or right. not. So the, so your, your all's idea is that agencies may implement the lower, the temporary retentions in capstone to capture all their employees' email, regardless of whether it's record or not, for those correct. durations, correct? And that's correct. what you're saying you guys have done with the journaling of all employees' emails unless they flag them as personal mm -hmm. or non-record. Our journal captures everything. Our ac archive crawls. Actually, I think our archive doesn't crawl on a daily basis, correct? Our archive crawls, I think, 90 days. So you have 90 days to create, yeah, our, our, yeah like everybody's, my, my colleagues are nodding, they're like, yes, you remember the training correctly. If I had <laughs> taken my training correctly. Our archive, our crawler is every 90 days. So after 90 days, the crawler goes through Gmail and says, I am now sucking up the records to, say, sucking up, that's a technical term we use. Um, I'm crawling, I'm, I'm copying the records, I'm storing it in our archive location. So we always say we have three locations. The journal file, which is for a totally separate information management purpose, our archive, which is for the records management purpose, and then of course the tool itself, which is sending and receiving. So we have very complicated uh, procedure when you come do a FOIA search at the National Archives. We know what our email is, we know what to collect it, we know how long it will be retained, so we're able to say what we were able to find. And that's again, very in-depth and question, very, those questions are great because that helps explain what one agency's done trying to implement the success criteria. Well, how many systems do we have? It wasn't actually that clear. Well, what policies did we have? Well, it depends on what we put in place and allowed people to do. NARA, the records office, may change that policy in the future, you know, depending on the data they get. Or they may say, this is great. This is, this is working for us. It keeps the numbers down, it, you know, makes the volume manageable, and we're able to uh, find the information we need for our business. So thank you for giving me a chance to explain the success criteria with a little case study there the only one I really feel comfortable talking about. Because I wouldn't want to talk about what other agencies have done without uh, probably having the expert up here talking as well. All right. Well, in that case, I'll invite Lawrence Brewer to come back and close our session. Thanks, Lisa. That was great. Um, oh, we have a question. We have one question uh, for Gordon. Uh, you mentioned surcharges uh, when you were speaking a while ago. Uh, Greg Schildmeyer asks, can you tell us the amount of the surcharge and what will it be for? While these amounts have not been approved by the archivist, I probably sh I'll give you an idea of what we're, what we're looking at, just from a budgeting standpoint, that the reference surcharge may be 375 um, a transaction, and a transfer surcharge somewhere around 750. However, uh, just keep in mind that uh, uh, we'll have these approved uh, by the archivist. These are recommended surcharges, and uh, these have not been approved yet, but um, you'll see that uh, come out in the packages this year. Okay. All right. Thanks, Gordon. So. Um, Welcome to the open mic section of the meeting. Um, I wanted to add one thing to what Lisa said. It was a, a great example of what NARA is doing as far as uh, 
capstones, assess criteria. Um, but I wanted to point everybody else to the uh, senior agency official reports that are up on our website. If you read through the reports, you'll see a lot of discussion and narrative about what a lot of other agencies are doing and planning um, in terms of how to meet the, the email goals. Um, you will see references to journaling. Um, I can't remember offhand which agencies were. There's so many of them up there, but I know they're there. Um, and there's a lot of other detail and content related to how agencies are meeting not only the 2016 goal, but the 2019 goal and the presidential administration and what activities they're doing to make that happen in reality in their agencies. So a lot of good information in there and you just need to go to our website, find the SAO page, and then you can find the link for all the reports. Um, I wanted to, since we have some time before we closed, um, and I know it's the first meeting of the summer and everyone's already thinking about their plans for what they're going to do on vacation. Um, but I'm really interested in maybe getting some feedback from all of you, if not today, maybe via email on what you would like to hear us talk about at future bridge meetings. So we have a very uh, rigorous process back at the archives and how we develop these agendas. And it goes something like this. Lisa, what do you want to talk about next month? Maggie, what do you want to talk about next month? Um, so we'd like to get away from that, and we know that there are always going to be things that we need to talk about and share with you, like the success criteria, like what we're doing to support the administration transition. Um, but I really would like to hear from you if there are things that you want to hear presented here at Bridge. I've always hoped that we will be able to do maybe some joint presentations with agencies about some of the activities that we do together, whether they are some of the oversight activities, inspections, um, focus groups, policies, how we develop white papers, and, and share some of that with the rest of the agencies. Um, and you know, if you have ideas of particular topics that you would like to hear, I would, I would love to, I, I actually have a pen here. I can write them down if you have anything that you want to share today. If not, again, RM Communications would be the place. Um, send us an email. What would you like to hear? Our next meeting's in August. Um, I'm guessing August is probably not going to be the most well attended meeting of the year. Um, but then after that, we have our first meeting in October. And I know that's when everybody is like back to work and ready to, to talk about what we're going to do in FY17. So I'll just turn it over right now. Before, you know, we can always have a longer lunch. But if any of you have any thoughts about you know, what you would like to hear from us um, at the August or the October meeting, um, I'll turn it over to you on, on the phone and in the room. Lawrence, this question actually comes uh, via email. Uh, and it would probably be more catered to Lisa, I think. Uh, Roxanne Batiste asks, will NARA assume the responsibility of ensuring non-records are not released for capstone officials should they receive a request? So do you want to read that again? I, I can read it again. I, I can read it again. Will NARA assume the responsibility of ensuring Non-records are not released for capstone officials should they receive a request. So our records, yes. NARS records. Yes, currently under the transfer bureau. Right. Will so, we assume the responsibility? Right. I, I mean, I would assume that our regular process in terms of, you know, how we would review records that have been identified for accessioning into the archives, we would review them for, um, you know, restrictions and access and, and they would be made available through the way we make our electronic records available. So similar to other, other processes for electronic records. And if I can, I'm coming back here just for the votes on the screen. So yes, NARA is assuming responsibility for that. As I said before, it's one of the, the risks or one of the challenges with the capstone approach. We have given ourselves an out as well. When you read the policy, it says agencies may call and NARA may call. So it is our intention over time as we take ownership of collections and we process them as archivists do, we know what's in our materials, we wanna make them available, we too will probably call out personal information because that would not normally be part of our collection policies. How we do that? is not yet to be determined because we're anticipating the volume of records that are going to come in electronically mean we have to have electronic processes. So we too have to develop the tools for archival processing that allow us to identify non-record 
personal copies and remove them from our collection. But if we haven't done that, it's still our responsibility to determine what can be released to the public and what can't. We have a wonderful organization that we could bring in for a bridge topic sometime to explain what NARA does with permanent records and how we understand and implement um, restrictions that are, we're, we're told go on record. So. Right, and, and those processes are the same. So whether we're talking about email or the electronic records, if we do that, we do that access review. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question because, you know, as we were talking about with Capstone, it's a totally different approach where you're looking at scheduling based on the role or the account or the official versus the content. So, you know, we do rely on, you know, the individuals to identify to the greatest extent that they can. We encourage culling of the, the non-record of the personal materials, but again, it's not required because that's what we're trying to do ultimately is make records management more efficient um, to take the user out of doing what needs to be done, which was the way it was done with content based where we were printing and filing and not doing it very effectively. So hopefully the end result is more records available, more records for us to review before releasing um, to the research rooms and to the websites. We got questions in the back. Uh, Theodore Hancock, uh, uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Um, it was mentioned that uh, records, as it relates to emails, but by extension, uh, records that are uh, have reached their retention. Um, I think a topic of discussion that would be helpful, at least especially for us in uh, Immigrations and Customs is related to review for legal or litigation holds and possibly best practices and other agencies, uh, what NARA suggests as to how uh, the methods can be streamlined and the review for of those records can be streamlined. I know it's different from agency to agency, how they review their records before the destruction of them. So it would be uh, great to hear uh, some ways in which agencies handle uh, those situations. Okay, no, that's good. Lawrence? Yeah. Hello. Troy, Troy Manigal, Energy. My question is pertaining to some of the issues we still see in the news with the IG report, what Lisa mentioned with regards to the category concerning access. W would NARA consider some kind of regulatory discussion about access for records officers and records professionals uh, to avoid issues, particularly around scheduling and some of these other activities where individuals and programs intentionally delay, stall, conceal, and it prevents us from executing what we need to do from a, a records perspective. And in different uh, arenas, you have credentials that specify your role, your classification as far as access to information, top secret, secret, and it gets you in the door. And it lets people know right up front, this is your role, this is why you're there. You must provide them assistance to execute the mission. It, it keeps us from having to beg, borrow, and plead to do our job. Something to consider. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good topic, maybe having some discussion about success stories where agencies, you know, have been able to get that access to do what we all know needs to be done. So if you're one of those agencies and you're in the room and you're on the phone, let me know and we'll see if we can arrange something along those lines. Anything on the phone, Arthur? Nothing right now. Okay. Um, so, again, I would just encourage you, if you have any uh, other thoughts, to send them to RM Communications. Um, as you can see, our next meeting is August 16th. Uh, we'll see what we can get set up as far as the agenda and you know, hopefully take into account some of the suggestions that for today. Um, and until then, have a great summer. Uh, enjoy your vacation. And we will see you back here in August. Thank you.